Okay, I will call this in-person meeting to order. Uh, Committee of the Whole, June the 23rd. Welcome everybody face-to-face. Uh, -face. We're loving this. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq. Uh, Lindsay, you have a record of attendance. There is no absent with regrets. <clears throat> Declaration of the conflict of interest. And you can certainly declare at the time of the agenda item. Approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions? Okay. Um, I thought I had an addition. Okay, Councillor Cleveland, seconded by Councillor Lesser. Any discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. No presentation. Okay, so staff reports, <clears throat> CAO report. I've never, I've never seen a, a request for decision under one of your reports. Go ahead. <clears throat> Your Worship, that's a little different. I asked for it intentionally. Uh, usually we don't have uh, Todd Muse come into uh, the Committee of the Whole, but I did ask him to leave his, his uh, regular work to come in and be here in case there were any questions of counsel on this. So I did put it under my report. Uh, if you want to deal with the report first, and then I can speak to the uh, certainly. request for decision. Yep, certainly. So any questions for the CAO on his report? <clears throat> Looks good. Okay, so the request for decision. Thank you, Worship. So um, the request for decision uh, comes to Council on a matter that, uh, as, as I think I indicated in an email, would not normally be brought to Council. Normally working with event sponsors on the details of using our facilities is something that staff does uh, in the regular run of, of business. Uh, but when, uh, when the decision of staff was communicated to the uh, event organizers for the shark scramble, uh, the response was is that they would be going to a higher level or going to council, going to the mayor. So we thought that we better, we better make sure we're on the same page and make sure council is aware of, of the concern. So primarily the concern around the fishing vessels and the shark scramble is that the, uh, the vessels have gotten bigger and uh, the, uh, the, the marina has gotten busier and clearing the uh, customers out of the marina for a what turns out to be ends up being close to a week uh, is a disruption to our regular customers and it puts additional strain and, and results in some damage to our infrastructure our <coughs> marina infrastructure the marina is essentially built for a small pleasure craft and uh, you've probably noticed everyone in the community knows that fishing boats have gotten larger and larger over the years and you know, 20 years ago or whatever, whenever the shark scramble started, the vessels, and we talked to, to the owner of, of, uh, of Rudder's Marina, and, and he, that was his observation as well, is that when they started the event, and he was one of the, one of the original organizers and sponsors, is that the boats that, that participated were, were significantly smaller. And uh, last, last year, the number of berths that were available for the fishing vessels was limited, I think, to six berths. And what happened, unfortunately, is that the vessels tied up side by side, as they sometimes do at the fishing wharves, and so that put not less strain on the infrastructure, but actually put more strain on the infrastructure. And so uh, it was communicated to the event organizers that we can certainly accommodate the unloading of the, uh, of the catches on the Rudder's Marina, or Rudder's Wharf, uh, by backing the vessels in, having them unloaded, and then have them depart to a uh, fishing wharf down the street. Um, you know, that changes certain elements of the event for, for the participants, but I think that change is, is necessary in terms of the condition and preservation of, of, the, of the marina infrastructure. But it also, uh, frankly, it takes, um, takes the vessels away. And sometimes associated with these events, uh, the vessels become, I mean, they are private vessels and, and private uh, functions happen on those vessels that don't necessarily... Um, aren't necessarily compatible with, with the public wharf and right-of-way that, uh, that we have around the, around the, uh, the wharf. So okay. uh, for those reasons, um, <coughs> we're recommending that, uh, that uh, and staff have conveyed to the, to the event organizers that the 
uh, wharf would be available for the unloading of catches, but there would be no berthing of the vessels at either marina, kilims, or rudders. Okay. So just for the shark scramble? So, yes. So, so fishing vessels, fishing boats, lobster boats, essentially. They, they don't tie they don't up there. They don't oh, tie up okay. there regularly, yeah. So yeah. my second question is, who polices this? And how do, how do we make sure that this happens? Like, this is well, infrastructure we need. Right. So, so we have marina staff. We have, we have two marina staff that, that uh, run the marina. And, uh, you know, we will police it to the extent that they can. And, and that is, you know, one of the things that we've been, we've been trying to get and through, through Todd and, and his staff is better cooperation uh, from the event organizers on <coughs> some of these issues that we've had. And uh, it hasn't been what it needs to be. And so Todd and his staff will do the best they can to police that. Uh, our concern, of course, is, is the infrastructure, our customers. We want them to have a successful event. It has been a successful event in the past. And, uh, you know, what they do up on the, on the wharf with the weighing of the sharks and that, I think that is interesting to, to our visitors and our community. But, uh, you know, berthing the, the fishing vessels at the fishing wharf where, where you know, that is of size, and, and, and strength to, to withstand the pressures of the, of the boats uh, is, uh, is what we need to do. Okay, I guess, I, okay. I guess I'm just thinking like, how do, are we gonna be able to police this? We need to have it in place, but I guess we just need to make sure that the staff is not, um, that's not hard on the staff. Does that make sense? I wanna protect the staff from, from having to deal with um, folks that don't want to listen. Yeah, so it, it's a limited change. As I said, we had only six births available to, six births, uh, Todd, last year. So it was limited with the opportunity that was there last year uh, for the fishing vessels. I think if you go way back in time, uh, the entire marina, at least on the rudder side, was cleared for, for the event. But over time, you know, the marina has gotten busier. We've, yeah. we've, I think Todd used his arm today to tell me how long the waiting list was for people to get uh, berthage at the marina. So the marina is, is a successful marina. Uh, if anything, we should be talking about how do we expand, expand our it. marina um, and, and not how do we move our customers out for, for this event. And, and, you know, I think it is possible to have this successful event right in the middle of our, of our waterfront in the, in the pedestrian or, or tourist friendly part of our waterfront to have this event. It's interesting, it's informative, educational, mm -hmm. uh, but the vessels themselves are, are so big and, and take up so much room and our marina is so busy that I think what's been pro proposed by staff here is, is the best uh, compromise okay. um, solution going forward. All right. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Hatfield. Uh, thank you. I just want a question for a clarification. When we're talking about the marina, um, I'm, I'm, is that are those the floating the floating docks, and that's what's causing that's right. the, the, diff, the problems with infrastructure when that's you've right. got multiple fishing boats, and they're not made for that. So I just kind of want I, that's how I interpreted it, but I just want to yeah. make that clear for yeah. the public that it isn't about the wharfs; it's about those floating docks and that's the right. pressure that it puts on that's those. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so what we're proposing is that the boats could come in. They could back up <coughs> to the wharf itself, the fixed structure, and they could unload with the, the crane they use there to unload the uh, the catches. And then they could, once they're unloaded, they they move off and, and tie up at the at the uh, port of Yarmouth, the the fixed fishing wharves, just you know a block or, or two over or a, a lot or two over, and and then the next boat comes in and, and unloads their catch. Um, we've uh, had contact with Greg Shea and uh, with Porting Yarmouth, and you know he's on with that plan. There's no issue with that. Okay. All right. So the recommended motion is that council support the recommendation of staff and allow no fishing vessels to berth at Killams and Rudders Marinas for the shark scramble, except for the offloading of catches. Who wants to make that motion? <coughs> Councillor Bell, second by Councillor Gill. Uh, there's. All right, any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, sorry, did you have a question? Sorry. Okay, I, I just wanted to 
to say that uh, I made the motion and I'm supporting the motion because primarily I'm very concerned about the infrastructure that we have put a lot of money in. Mm -hmm. um, and as the clerk, as the uh, CAO has said, um, the marina is becoming more popular. Uh, it's getting known throughout the province. I hear from people who uh, have come in here and been absolutely stunned by the amenities that are here, the way they're treated, what's available to them, and also the, the ability to be on a working waterfront where mm -hmm. you are, um, you know, where you're rubbing shoulders with the actual work of, of, of marine, you know, marine uh, industry. Um, so I don't want to do anything that uh, puts our marina in jeopardy, and I recognize that the it's an incapacity, it's, it's an incompatibility issue, and um, and it is unfortunate. But but that I support the motion for those yeah. reasons. Thanks. Good. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor. Yeah. Um, well, having been involved in a new number of the um, Yarmouth yacht races over the years, um, I can tell you that the infrastructure isn't uh, capable of supporting larger boats. And any time we had a yacht that was oversized, it had to go to a mooring. It was that simple. I fully understand that, uh, that the participants in the shark scramble would like to stay in the area where the party's taking place, but uh, you're right. We can't jeopardize our infrastructure for that reason. So I will be supporting the motion for that reason. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, motion carried. So I have a question for you now, CAO. How do we get, um, let's add on to the marina on the docket for the next meeting? We, so, we need to at least discuss it. That's a lot of. So I think that's a great topic for our waterfront advisory committee. Perfect. So we need to get that up and running. Perfect. And uh, that's, 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 a, that's an issue. Right? When it is an issue. And I, I think the, the Waterfront Corporation had recognized that that was coming and there were other options on our waterfront. Mm -hmm. so, so hopefully that's, awesome. uh, that's something we can dig into. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else for the CAO? Uh, fire Department report and the Chief is here. <clears throat> we were just at the uh, upstairs in the Fire Department last night, Chief, and in, quite enjoyed it again. Any questions for the chief? Okay, good. Uh, operational services, Chad is here. Any questions? Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Chad? I have a question. Why a new, why the new pride bench? What happened to the pride bench? Pardon me? We have a new pride bench. Why do we have a new one? Um, the old, the old one. If you remember, the pride bench that we that we purchased was kind of a compromise to the request we got to put in the pride crosswalk. So we bought it kind of quickly. Quickly, we, that's we, right. Yeah, and it was local. Yeah. It was literally two hundred dollars, but it, it fell into some disrepair okay. over the last. All right. Couple of years. I wondered if there was vandalism. Okay. Um, I have an, I have another one. Sure. The crosswalk on Hibernia, and maybe one on Prospect. What's the chances before the school year? I don't know how the process works, so. Well, the one on Hibernia is, is still under review. We just, uh, engineering did a traffic count for us um, okay. just last week, so we're analyzing the, the data. Uh, okay. I apologize, I, I know no. it's taken a long time. No, it's, you can't make it go any faster with yeah. the, the data. I just didn't know what, if, like, is it a possibility before the next school year? Because we're getting that, we're also getting crossing prospect, right? I'll make this promise. We'll, we'll make a decision before the school year. Okay. Um, prospect Street's new to me, I don't recall. <laughs> no, probably hasn't come. It's okay. just I just keep getting messages about trying to get kids over to Meadowfields. <coughs> Sorry, Councillor. Pardon me? It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't from Councillor Lesser. We just want to make note of that in the minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, Councillor Heather. Uh, yeah, I, it's, more, it's just a comment more for the, the public that might be uh, listening today. Uh, I just note in your report that there is... Um, certified a compost now available for sale at the compost yes. uh, yeah. uh, facility for anybody who, who wants that. So, yeah. thanks. I have one more. Sure. I think we mentioned it, but I don't think we did anything with it. Seminary and Collins one way. I just don't, I don't get it. 
Um, we had a request from, I think, one local citizen a couple of years ago to, to for us to consider reverting it back to 2A. Okay. Um, I think we've deferred the decision um, until we know what the future use is going to be of the central school. Because okay. what we don't want to do that's is revert it back to 2A yep. and nope, have a similar use in the, in the central school that's only fair. to have the mask for one way street again. So. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. That was that was my questions. Anyone have questions for for Chad? Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know uh, what the answer is to this, but I'm I'm doing a lot of walking downtown and on the waterfront and I'm just wondering if there is a program for maintenance of the downtown light standards because I noticed some of them are in Pretty hard repair. Some of them are actually gone completely, and there's just the wires and the ballast sticking up at the. So I just wondered what 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 we do to maintain those light standards. Yeah, there is a there is an inspection and maintenance program. Um, we kind of fall, I'll admit we've fallen behind a bit. Um, we've gotten prices to replace some some posts and fixtures over the last couple of years. COVID has driven the price of goods and and the availability of goods. Um, We'll get back on it. If you if you see any anything specific areas in your walks, please send us a message. Anyone else? Good stuff. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Okay, we have planning and economic development, and Natalie's here. Any questions for Natalie? I I have to say I love the approach on the unsightly, um, and some of the particular places that um, need a little bit of attention. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Lesser. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm going to echo that as well. The unsightly properties that existed, you know, a few years ago are, are becoming fewer every day. Um, I actually thought I was going to report one the other day myself, and the next day it was, I don't know if it was on your list or how it happened, but it, it got cleaned up pretty quick. And um, But my question isn't around that. It's... Uh, on the way here today, uh, by the Fisherman's um, Memorial, there's a, like a mobile instrument. Is that is that the one that we had talked about before as the possibility of, it's like a, a xylophone type of thing, kids are down playing? You probably didn't see it. It's, it's like a mobile band. It's the big... Uh, Oh, yeah. the instruments? Yeah. yeah. The mobile instruments that the Rotary Club Chamber yes. has installed? So that is, that's ours now? Like it's our... We don't own it. No. But it, it is owned by the Chamber and they put it in various places for people to engage with. There were all kinds of kids down there playing it. It was, it was quite nice to see. Yeah. I guess Thank it's you. doing what it needs to do. Yeah. Exactly. Any more questions for Natalie? Uh, Val, go ahead. Yeah, I was interested. Oh, sorry, Natalie. You just, just want if, me to get my steps this in. This is just a request. This is just a request for for the for next month. I'm wondering. Um, there's a graph for building permits that shows year to year, and I'm wondering, would it be possible to get a pre-pandemic comparison? Because it looks like we're going gangbusters. I mean, there's been a big increase in... Yeah, we can do that. That's no problem. And I just wondered, just for my own, so yeah. that I'd have a sense of where we are pre-pandemic. Happy to do that. Yeah, great, thanks. No, we're good. I was just trying to find the 15-minute the, um, city concept, which, which was something new to me. So I, that was a little learning curve. Okay, good. <clears throat> Engineering report, and is Mr. Brophy here? He's not, but you know what? I'll bet you our engineer is. <laughs> Your Worship, um, I'm pleased to advise Council that Mario Dunkley is has been appointed as the town engineer. Congratulations. Thank you. You're, you're, I mean, you already know you're going to love it. <laughs> and you've had, I, I, I don't know that anybody can get any better experience than the last couple of years because these projects have been huge and you've run so many of them and 
So thank you for everything you've done. And um, any questions for our engineer? It's kind of exciting to say it. Oh, come on. I told him it would be hard the first <laughs> meeting. <laughs> oh, all right. So far, so good. Don't be looking for that same thing next meeting. <laughs> Okay, finance. Jerry's here. Oh, he's coming to the microphone without being asked. That just can't be good. <laughs> I think, are we good? We're good. That was a, a bit of an oversight on our part. I'll take some. Saying where we're good? No. Uh, the report, a request about reallocating some budget for capital. Okay. For Mayor Center, that's in there. So, yeah. <clears throat> Duran's been looking for, the CEO of the Mariner Center has been looking for a response from myself or Jeff to say that we've officially approved his budget form. Uh, in, the, in the process in our town operating budget, I do make sure and made sure that the allocated or money required for operations was in our operational budget. But we never specifically talked about Duran's capital list. So in the capital list, uh, the other, our partners have sent official letters saying budget's been approved and their share of the capital has been approved, that kind of thing. So I've since talked to Duram, said I just make it official. We do have the flexibility within our budget, as I pointed out in the, in the letter. Uh, but I uh, just wanted to make sure that everyone's aware of what we're doing and so that we can officially let Duram know that it's been done. He's also pointed out that he's been... Uh, quite busy and he's he's behind on his capital already so he goes I'm not going to get 400 spent this year anyway, <laughs> so, but I do need some so. good stuff any questions for Jerry thanks for that Jerry okay thanks any questions we're good okay go ahead so we should have a motion uh, yep. to to confirm that certainly okay second by councillor deputy mayor all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Yes. Good. Okay, Yarmouth Recreation and Frank's here. Any questions for Frank? Looks like you got a busy agenda there. This is awesome. Got hit kids hired. You having success with that? It's, it's been uh, probably the most challenging uh, summer hiring staff. It's, um, if you're not alone. It's ev every yeah, it's business, everywhere. every... Um, you know, normally when we make calls uh, looking for staff, excitement, yeah. yes, when do I start? And now it's, is it every day in the summer? Um, yeah. eight, eight hours a day? <laughs> so, uh, and seriously, and can, yeah. and this is the worst part. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, 19 summer positions. I've got 15 filled, and I'm waiting for callbacks because some of our prospective employees uh, need time to, to ponder. So it's delaying start times. We're trying to scramble, move people around, and it's. It's really got me thinking about our entire program and how are we going to deal with this if this is just year one of changes with, the, with our human resources. Yeah, I remember we said at the committee meeting, like, what if, we, what if we gave them some more money? I don't know, an extra buck or a couple bucks well, an hour is going to matter. It's I, the did, I did do some research, you know, because there were some current concerns that we weren't paying enough. We, yeah. we are competitive in the Valley and South yeah. Shore for what we're paying uh, summer staff coordinators are a dollar more an hour than minimum wage and leader positions are at minimum wage, yeah. which we know has <laughs> gone up a couple times in the last year. Um, some departments have gone, and I don't know how they manage it. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was explained to me and I still couldn't quite figure it out that they've gone to lump sums, telling hiring a staff person saying that you can make fifty six hundred dollars in a in a summer if you work all of these hours it's up to you but how do we do that if we if someone says well I'll only work for three thousand dollars so that means we have to hire two people to fill that one position to 
to make sure our, our staff ratios within programs are covered. So I, 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 that would, that's what the town of Kentville has done. They've kind of tr tried to change it up so it doesn't look like an hourly rate and it's more of, wow, I can make 5,600 bucks in the summer, but if they choose to make less, then it impacts all the other things and you have to hire more. And we, we, have, to meet, we have to get so many hours for each student to qualify for our summer grants. And it's, it's been a challenge, but I think the 15 we got will be good. Okay. Um, if we don't fill those other positions, then we'll try to be creative and trying to fill them in a different way. But um, it's been a challenge, but we're forging ahead. Uh, the deputy mayor is uh, rallying council for some Canada Day activities um, to kick off the summer, and then all of our programs start on July the 4th. Awesome. Uh, deputy mayor? Yeah, just to speak further to uh, what Frank said, he was up to the school there this week. We had a great meeting. Uh, we're going to do, council's going to do a breakfast on Canada Day morning. Uh, some great events planned for Canada Day actually at the South End Park. Looking forward to that to bring back the old glory there. Uh, Canadian Tire actually donated a 12 foot kayak that'll be given away as a prize and some other things. So oh just glad gosh. that we're back to actually planning and getting things rolling. So. You know, it's nice to be here again and even just back here for a meeting and hopefully it's a full summer of fun. And I'd, as far as employees go, I, I work with kids. I know I know your pain. I understand it's not for lack of effort. You've been up to no. the school a few times. We try to push it ourselves. So, but looking forward to a, a good summer of events, hopefully. So, yeah, it's um, everyone's screaming. I get calls all the time from businesses saying, what well, can, can you help me get employees? They can't get employees. Yeah. Anybody. Uh, Councillor Lesser. Just thinking of the first world problems that we're having right now. Right. Um, yeah, it's amazing to think that rec jobs, which were back in our day, was were the jobs to get, and now, like, yeah, they're out there and people don't want them. It's amazing, but it's not. It's not the job. It's the there just isn't the workforce that are willing to do the work. So, um, actually, my I didn't want to bring it up as a different topic, but. Um, just thinking of what's happened in Yarmouth in the last little bit, especially at Yarmouth High, um, involving sports, I think speaks to some of the facilities and some of the things we have going on here. Um, we had a girl named Olivia Hamilton that won gold at wrestling uh, at nationals at U17. Um, senior girls softball were provincial champs. I'm not sure if that's, I don't like, some of these things are, are certainly first, but I've never heard of this many provincial records in a, in a short time. Um, Jahil, Jaleel Horton uh, won the gold at 100 meter. Um, interesting story, I think somebody mentioned to me that um, he just decided one day, I think I'm gonna try running this year. Um, decided to run and beat everybody and I think the park few people that were there that have been running their whole lives kind of like, who is this guy? And he, <laughs> he just, yeah, it's pretty impressive that somebody can just start running and get the 100 meter. Um, Zoe Schwan with discus. Um, she won provincial gold, uh, and Ben LeBlanc second in hurdles. I'm not sure, Deputy Mayor, if I'm missing others, but we've we've had some pretty impressive sport accomplishments over the the last little bit. And I don't know what that's going to mean for your sports awards coming up, but it's it's uh, it says it speaks to the you know to the facilities and the need for even better facilities in in Yarmouth when we have people people winning provincial and national titles. So that's good. Yes, definitely. They'll be on our uh, athletic awards uh, ceremonies in the fall. Good stuff. Okay. Anything else for Frank? We're good. Thank you. Okay. Business uh, Yarmouth Farmers Market. The recommended motion there is to recommend the council grant forty three hundred to the Yarmouth Farmers Market because of their successful application from ACOA. Okay. Second by Councillor Dares. Go ahead, CAO. Yeah, I think a bit of an explanation here of how this is coming to you now at this time is um, a letter of support was provided to them uh, last year, and it was to be um, it was to be included in your consideration at budget time. Unfortunately, we missed it. Um, it didn't get to the director of finance, and so it didn't get <coughs> incorporated in your budget package. And so uh, they were successful <laughs> in their application. That's great. And so the, the ask coming back is, so how did we make out the budget? Well, oops, our fault. Um, didn't uh, have it for you at that time. So 
apologies for that, but it's a good news story outside of outside of our midst. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Dares. While they're asking for 4,300 um, from each of the municipal units, they're also committing 4,300 uh, fundraising on their own. So I think that's admirable as well. Love it. Yeah, yeah. You know we're. We're finding we're finding more and more that the the uh, organizations events all those that that are taking it upon themselves like the splash park, right? They uh, they get it done. Okay. So all anything else? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Next one is Tusket Track, and I don't see anything under it, so it's going to be this. CAO is going to have to explain that one after he has this conversation. Hmm? Yeah, we're just at Tusket Track. Oh, you want you, your Worship, oh. Councillor Dares had asked that, that be added to the agenda. Yeah. So, Councillor Dares, I just have to go grab that. Oh, yeah, at the, um, at the most recent Mariner Centre Expansion Committee meeting, uh, the CAO over Argyle reminded those in attendance that it, uh, some years ago there was a commitment from the town of Yarmouth, I think it was up to $200,000 to support a project to expand the Tusket track, I believe to a, a permanent surface, eight, eight lane track with a permanent surface. And um, of course that has, I think the, the town probably carried that on their budget for a number of years and since there wasn't any legs under it, it eventually got uh, taken off the, the table. So um, it, was, it was a reminder that that project is still um, viable. They would like to proceed in the future. They understand that, um, that the Mariner Center Expansion Committee is not the vehicle that should be used. Um, so I think what's going to occur is that there will be a, uh, a similar board or committee formed to try to um, develop that park, or that track into a competitive track and to do so before the next Acadian Games. So um, I just wanted to sort of give a heads up that that's the direction they're going and uh, I think we should probably plan for that in the future. Okay, go ahead, uh, Councilor Cleveland. Did you have your light? Your light one? That was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, CAO. So, Your Worship, I, I can fill in some additional details and and uh, uh, on that. So, uh, it was about seven years ago that that the Joint Council set some regional priorities, and those were big ticket items: Mariner Center expansion. Uh, there was an airport priority in there, and I think maybe the ferry terminal was the uh, was the third one. I'm going from memory here, but. The fourth one was the was the track, and the reason it was excluded or taken off the list of regional priorities was because all of the others were you know north of ten million dollars, mm -hmm. and here was the track at one point two million dollars. And so I think it was uh, Deputy Mayor Mooney who who suggested we take it off and we just do it. And so that was the the that was the first thing that he said, and I think the second thing he said is, and that we should, the town, commit to one-third of the local cost. So in Argyle's, in, in the municipality of Argyle's view, the track should be paid for at least 50% from either the province or the federal government, and that the local contribution should be half or less. And so we budgeted the maximum of half, so two hundred a third of, of 600000 and. As Alain pointed out uh, at, at the recent meeting, you know the cost of that track may be two things. He said that were important to, to know is that the cost now may be north of two million dollars because seven years has passed, COVID has happened, nothing's gone down, everything's gone up. But the other thing he said that was important is that maybe it's not an eight-lane track. So an eight-lane track gives you a competitive track where you can host provincial events. But the truth is, is that. Um, the only provincial event that draws a lot of a lot of track and field athletes is the school athletic federations track and the provincials. That event moves from region to region, and I think there are four regions in the province. There are this would be the fourth track in our region. So your best opportunity for hosting provincials, the big provincials, is once every 16 years. 
uh, it's, it might not be worth shoehorning in the extra two lanes. Whereas you can hold districts, which is a pretty big meet, you can hold club, uh, club events, um, and you can entice and get more people participating in the, in the sport because you'll have better facilities. And you'll have more people like Jaleel and, and others who've won provincial championships achieve everything they can be in track and field. Uh, so I think we need to be prepared for two things. Is one is that if we're going to do, if we're going to do something about a track, let's get on with it. Um, and be prepared that, it, that our share might end up being more than 200,000 given the costs have escalated since we, since we encouraged, uh, since we initially encouraged uh, uh, that the project go ahead. So, um, yeah, so there will be a committee, I guess. And, uh, but is there a motion, Councillor Dares, is there a motion that we need today from, from this group? Uh, I don't believe so. I think we need to wait until um, Argyle initiates a committee. Uh, and then we'll, we'll hear from the committee. This is just a heads up that this is coming down the pipe. Thanks for that. Okay, we're good. Uh, compliant communication policy amendments. The recommended motion there is to recommend that council amend the communications policy and to update the name to complaints policy. <laughs> yeah, so, so we had a, we had a communications policy, so called, but it was really a complaint policy, and, a, and there is a, a misspelling that will get that will get fixed after this meeting. There's a couple uh, of things, yeah. So it's not a compliant policy. No. Nope. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's just some small amendments to the policy, and one of the one of the ones particularly is that if, if, when we receive complaints, we want to get them in writing, and the email is considered in writing. Uh, verbal complaints, you know, we'll ask staff will ask uh, people complain. Not that we'll ignore them, but if we're if we're going to track complaints then we need to, to have it in writing so that it's not our interpretation of what somebody else said. Give us, and we do have forms at the front counter mm -hmm. for that. We do receive uh, concerns or, or heads up through C -click fix and, and through emails, of course. So, uh, that, and through Facebook messages to us. And through Facebook messages occasionally, <laughs> that kind of thing, like, yeah. yeah that's, so. that's the hard part, because I, I guess I'm, I'm old school. I still don't consider that a formal we try, try yeah. to direct them better. Okay, so are we good with, with that? Can I have the motion? Did somebody make the motion? Okay, Councillor Heather Hatfield, Deputy Mayor. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Meadowfields Community School Playground. Go ahead, Councillor Dares. <coughs> Um, yes, you might be aware that the, the playground at Meadowfield School, which services um, a significant population of uh, school children from the town, but also from the, our neighbors, um, the playground in the, at the school has been condemned. And uh, one of the uh, uses that is fairly common for that is through the summer months, the Recreation Department holds their day camps there, and that playground was a very popular fixture. At any rate, um, there is a, a um, an initiative underway to try to replace the playground, and uh, spearheading the uh, fundraising for that would be Lori McClay. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we invite Lori McClay to council to make a presentation on behalf of the Meadowfield School uh, for funding for the playground, and um, I can provide the contact information. Okay. So moved. I got a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Cleveland. Any further discussion? We wrote a letter of support for that. Uh, nope, that was for an outdoor classroom, but oh, we, was yeah, it? We, yeah, I believe so. Not the playground. Uh, it might have been. I don't know. I'm not aware of the letter of support for the playground, but wow. Um, okay. I just know that it's not going to be accomplished through bake sales. <laughs> no, it's you know. not. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Deputy. I just think it's sad that we build schools and these things aren't included when we build them. How do you build a school and not have a place for kids to, to play? I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it was the same frustration when YES was built and they come. And, but thankfully, we have driven community members that see the importance of it and it gets done at the end of the day. But I just think if anyone's talking to an MLA or anyone in the provincial government, it might be something nice to add. Yeah. And I think a couple things. We keep paying for it, which we will, <laughs> but we keep paying for it. And they will keep not providing it. Um, and it's a place for play, but, but in my estimation, 
it's it's another place besides the cat the classroom to socialize the children right like it's so important it's such an important part of school and um not just for fun and after school exactly so it's not it is a part for me it's a part of education go ahead CAO. yeah i just i wanted to point out on that one that that school is over 20 years old yeah and and there there were two pretty good playgrounds my kids used to love to go to those playgrounds but they've been worn out they've become worn out um uh and and fallen into disrepair just you know the weather takes its toll as we know in our own town playground so it's time for replacement and uh, and I think that's what the effort is here is is it I think there was a pretty good playground package with that particular school it was a p3 and so I don't know if there was an enhancement from the community at the time but uh, those were pretty good playgrounds uh, at the outset and uh, you know maybe not for the number of kids but uh, I know after hours my kids used to love to go to that to that school yeah go ahead I will say that those playgrounds, uh, that playground in particular, has been well used. Uh, it's very seldom you drive by there throughout the summer to not see anybody there. Yeah. And I know that part of the component of the uh, proposal is uh, to improve the safety of the playground as well, to limit the amount of interaction between the children that are using the playground and vehicular traffic. So that's one of the components that's being considered. And accessibility is another. So each of those components comes with a cost as well. Yeah. So here's a question. We, we fund the playgrounds that the province should be funding, but we fund those. Do they maintain them? Even though, we, like, who builds them? Do we give them the money to build it, or do we build it? Do you know that? Like, look, I'm just going to say it. Todd's not going to have to maintain a playground just because we provided the funds for it. it's a school okay I had to check that <laughs> don't need to pile on more okay all right so the motion's been made and seconded go ahead councillor Bell uh, thank you your worship I'm I'm just sort of dusting the cobwebs off of my brain that was a triple P school right that was a school that P3, was built yeah. by a private uh, entity and then leased by the school um, it was the playground part of the initial package or was that an ad, community use of school add-on? I mean, I'm just wondering what are the responsibilities of the, of the private partner to maintain it and how long was that agreement for? I don't know anything. I'm just, yeah. just trying to sort of figure out who's, re, who, who's so, ultimately going so to be initially, responsible. So initially, your worship, if I okay. yes. uh, So the school was built as a P3 on a 20-year lease. Um, and as the lease expired, the province actually bought the school. So it's no longer privately owned, no, but the private partner was responsible during the term of the lease to staff and to maintain uh, the, the facility. I would say that, yeah, I, I shouldn't say anything but, uh, about it, but you know, playgrounds do deteriorate over time. And uh, I don't know that if it was unsafe when it was under private ownership, I don't know that. And I don't know that it's unsafe now that I defer to the people who know the playground better than I do. Good. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Special events application and guidelines. The recommended motion there is to recommend that council approve the public spaces special events application and guidelines. Councillor Heather Hatfield. Second by Councillor Cleveland. Go ahead, Councillor. Sure. I have a question, and I apologize for not asking it actually long before this. But things have been kind of busy, and so it, it kind of went past me. But this public space is special event app, it's, it's fantastic. It kind of coordinates everything, and it puts everything together. But uh, one thing it mentions, it mentions buskering in public spaces and the fact that there's no permit needed. But we have spots. Um, and, and perhaps if, if Natalie could come up, uh, I, have a, I have a question about, like, for example, if somebody wants to book the coal shed, um, how does one do it? It's, it's not really clear in here, do we call you, do, would it be you that would be called? Or? Yeah, so, so typically, anyone that wants to busker, they don't need to have a permit, but they need to register with our department. Right. Uh, just so that we can review 
the rules of engagement. Um, and then as long as we know where they are, that those are permitted with whatever the, the, the guidelines, setbacks, et cetera, then they go ahead and we monitor uh, if there's a complaint. Okay, so when it comes to buskering, it, it, perhaps there should be a bit of a definition of because buskering, you, in your mind, you picture buskering as, you know, setting up on the corner and, and playing perhaps in one of those lobster carts or that kind of thing. Um, if someone wants to play, say, over at Frost Park, is that buskering or is that making a booking for that space? That's uh, buskering. And we actually have a bylaw. It's called the Street Vendors Bylaw that actually uh, defines buskering and the process for that. So this, this is special events. As like parades. And that yeah, kind of so we thing. do okay. have both. And so the purpose is uh, when this is passed is for us to bring those things together so people know what is for public spaces and then the other bylaws as it relates to licenses and other street permits. Okay. One final question, and then I'll leave you be. And that is, like, for example, if someone, I don't know, books a street parade, for example, does that automatically go on to the events page that we have set up? How does that part of it work? So uh, the answer is yes. Once it's approved by the town, which um, there are other departments, so traffic authority, all of the other players are still part of it. Once it's done, it gets notified to communications. And communications is, uh, is uh, currently responsible for updating the community events calendar. And then it also gets notified to, to YASTA so they can put it on theirs as well. Cool. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Anything else? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Go ahead, CAO. Your Worship, I just want uh, to give a shout out to Natalie and uh, for coordinating. I guess that that's a huge amount of work, and a number of other staff worked with her on it. But pulling that all together was a was a, was yeah. a very good, a significant piece of work, and, and done very well. Thanks, Natalie. Okay, uh, destruction of documents. The recommended motion there is to recommend the council approve the destruction of documents in the attached list. Don't destroy any housing documents, Jeffrey. <laughs> Go ahead. Your, your Worship, uh, <laughs> before we destroy documents, we have to get council approval. That's just the, the process. And of particular note here, there are no housing documents within, <laughs> within these files. Um, Um, I, I want to point out, because it is the most significant thing on the list, it is the last thing on the list. All records of the Southwest Shore Development Authority. So we have been the holder of the SWASTA documents since uh, SWASTA's uh, wind-up bankruptcy, investigations, and charges. Uh, we've held on the documents. As some of you will know that I think the, the last uh, matter related to the whole SWASTA experience. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I think we are. I think we're at the end of that. When we have ink on paper, uh, we will, with your blessing, uh, destroy the documents. Okay. Because when you say "I think," I'm like I'm not letting go. With <laughs> I'm not letting go with that yet. No. no until there's there's. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And nothing else going to pop up. Wow. Okay. Look at the date on that. Oh, no, that was the yearly de detail register, 2003. Okay, so can I have a motion to destroy these pending approval? Go ahead, Councillor Lesser. I'm just looking through, I think, all the date. It's seven years that we need to keep financial. Is that correct? I'm not sure you're saying this. Okay. Um, and it looks like all of them are obviously past that. Is um, including the last one, it just doesn't have a date. Is that, would that also be... I'm just thinking of how many are there things in those documents in the last one that have happened since um, financially. No, those, those that event, the the uh, wind up of Swasta was around 2010, so we're we're a solid 12 years uh, past that. Any documents that were generated in the interim, you know, would have been between municipalities. Swasta though had ended. Uh, as an entity, and so we're talking about the entity's records. 
that were that were destroyed. Good. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Bell. Oops. That's all right. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, no objections, but just an observation or, or a question, I guess, with regard to historical significance and is there any is there any historical significance in these records and is there is there any um, interest in reaching out to the historical society to see if they would like to be the holder of these records i have i'm just asking the question i have no idea Give it a go. Uh, I, I, and that hadn't occurred to me, um, honestly. Um, looking at the documents, there's some things that would have to be removed and destroyed. Uh, there's, there's things like uh, check registers, there's financial documents yeah. that, uh, you know, paycheck information, that kind of stuff that should be destroyed. It's personal information. Uh, as far as reports, minutes, uh, that kind of thing, um, we could do that. We could, we could do that. Uh, they, I'm not sure that they that they hold a lot of value. Maybe some interest uh, for somebody down the road, you know, doing a doing having a look back at what happened in Yarmouth in the in the 1980s and 90s and early 2000s. Um, you know, there's certainly some information there, um, and and I would never say best based on some of our recent activities that old records carry no value that's right <laughs> um, but uh, you know if, if that's if that's the wish that we make that approach to see if somebody wants to be somebody else wants to be the custodian of these documents um, all that will mean is that we'll have to go through them and remove any of the any of the more sensitive items and, and again the sensitivity is only around personal information it's not around subject matter Okay. What do you think, folks? I mean, we don't know what's in there of value, but. It's a long time so I I think it should be worth Or at least offered. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, well, Your Worship, can I make a motion that the CAO contact the uh, Yarmouth Historical Society and Archives uh, to ascertain the level of interest they might have in uh, securing the publicly accessible parts of those uh, documents and, and report back to Council? So, Lindsay. Oh, look, we've got an engineer sneaking in the back door. Um, <laughs> Lindsay, did we make a motion to destroy them? We didn't vote, but did we? No, but did we? We haven't yet? Okay, I, I, I asked because I usually get a motion on the floor before we yeah. discuss, but I didn't remember who made those. Okay, so, so, the, so Bell's is the first motion on this one. Okay. All right. I'm good with that. Go ahead, Councillor Dares. So I'm just wondering, are we going to follow, is that going to be a two-part motion? Um, so if there is no interest by the historical society, then we would proceed to destruction? I would amend the motion to include the second part, yes. I'll second that. Okay. Moved and seconded. Go ahead, Councillor uh, Lesser, and then CAO. Um, Without getting into too much detail, um, there are some times that errors are made that um, going back over records might work in our favor. Um, so like I said, not going into too, a lot of details, I guess in the, with your professional judgment, would you say there's anything here that would fit into that category or that could? Who knows? Uh, you know, who knows? I, I, a little doubtful. I mean, there's probably some interesting stuff in there, and to, again, to somebody who's who's 
you know, I don't know who it would be doing a project, but if somebody's doing project or research at some point, what was going on around you know, business development or whatever in this community in that period of time, there are reports in there. There are reports in those boxes that, that might be of interest. Um, you know, if the, if the historical society is interested in them, I, I can say that uh, when I first started here, um, I was invited, I and council were invited to the, to the archives because prior to Ray Gallant leaving, uh, he took a lot of documents, boxes of documents, and gave them to the Historical Society. And they, the reason we were invited over is they needed a shelf to put them on. <coughs> and their shelves are not cheap. Um, and so that's one part of the story. And we did provide money to, to provide one of those shelves that you crank and it moves along. And, um, recently on this, you, you know from our recent meeting that I'm on a Lindsay is Lindsay's doing a lot of work around finding uh, old documents uh, to to help to fill in blanks on a on a matter. Well, her recent, most recent um, inquiry was with the archives. You know what is what is on those shelves that might be relevant to this search? And there are a few things. And so tomorrow, as early as tomorrow, Lindsay's going to be uh, visiting the archives and looking through some of those old files. So you never know uh, what someone might be looking for um, so I, I'd say we offer it and uh, if they're up for it then we will instead of destroying uh, move the documents to their custody are we good we ready for the vote okay all those in favor aye, aye. contrary motion carried Correspondence, Yasta, Nova Scotia Music Week. The recommended motion there is to recommend that council provide a letter of support and a financial commitment of $10,000 for each year Yasta is successful in hosting Nova Scotia Music Week. <laughs> uh, and Neil seconded it. I'm just looking at the, for every year Yasta is successful. So you don't have to keep coming back? <laughs> Yes, okay. <laughs> that is why, because the discussions that are being held are for two years. Oh. Uh, we're looking at and putting a bid in for 2023 and 2024. Okay, thank so, you for that. Yeah. I've never seen a motion like that, so. <laughs> yeah, up to, yeah, we should put a maximum on it. Oh God, no, no, we're not gonna put a maximum. We're gonna take all we can get. Okay, so did you second that? Okay. Um, yeah, two things that I, that I appreciate here is that I don't think that amount has increased over the time that they applied for funds years ago. So uh, it's a very uh, modest ask, I think. And secondly, I think it's noteworthy that the uh, that event typically takes place in the off season. So it fills hotel rooms and fills restaurants um, at a time when they're most needed. So it's a very good good um, event to have. Perfect. Yeah. Go ahead, deputy. Just a small request. I know sometimes we get these letters to fund things or whatnot, and then when the events come around, uh, the um, I guess the information that I find out about it is on Facebook or whatnot. So if we could be requested that some more information come to council directly, and just so we know what's going on personally, and not have to go find it on the internet yeah. or anywhere else, that would be greatly appreciated. Sounds good. Okay. Anyone else? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary. Motion carried. Uh, presentation request, Yarmouth Golf and Country Club, and the recommended motion there is that council invite Phil Mooney, Richard Herbert, and Colin Frazier to present at September Committee of the Whole for the Yarmouth Golf and Country Club. Looking for a motion. Deputy Mayor, second by Councillor Heather. Any discussion there? All those in favor? Aye. Contrary. Motion carried. Fishing Gear Coalition of Atlantic Canada letter of support. A recommended motion is to recommend that council provide a letter of support to the Fishing Gear Coalition of Atlantic Canada for their DFO Ghost Gear Fund application. So there's no financing involved for us. It's just we're providing a letter of support. Yep. Go ahead, CAO. Your Worship, this, this appears to be late. And, and I was told it was late. There was a deadline to make their application, but I don't think a letter of support uh, is ever 
a bad thing to send. Mm -hmm. Even if the application's already been submitted, they can follow it up. I don't know if it's been successful or not, but um, what they're what they're proposing to do is is interesting. And uh, uh, like I say it doesn't cost us anything to provide a letter of support, and uh, it's in line with with issues that we have. So. Okay. It was sorry. I should also say. It, as you can see from the email and the deadline, there was not much time to deal with it, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a council meeting to bring it to. Okay. So, good, Councillor Dayer. Yeah, and I note that they're um, they're asking for in-kind support um, by the waste park, solid waste park, providing information as to when the project begins and uh, get that information out via social media. I also see a role for um, waste check in here, and so we'll be bringing that to the table at waste check to make sure that they're involved in the. Education and public information component. Good. Okay, so did somebody make the motion? Hmm? All right, so we need a motion. Councillor Bell? Okay, thank you. Did you have, did you want to share anything? You're good? Yep, I'm good. Okay, so moved by Councillor Bell, second by Deputy Mayor. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. <clears throat> Youth Advisory Group, the recommended motion there is, no, we're, we're yep, I see that. Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Coordinator, the recommended motion is to recommend that Council support applications for funding for an Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Coordinator for the Town of Yarmouth. CAO. Your Worship, I'm bringing this forward uh, today. The timing of this is is awkward because we've we've only been uh, a month or so past uh, approving our budget. But uh, uh, it, last last week, uh, Jerry and I attended the AMA conference, and a couple of the sessions dealt with equity, diversity, and inclusion. What's going on in in Halifax municipality specifically, and uh, and I'm aware of some activities some, some very positive things going on in Kings County um, this is an area in which uh, we haven't put any um, specific targeted resources um, and I think we have a long way to go uh, we've we're not horrible on these things but you know what when you when you when you put yourself and this is what happened at the conference is that through a couple sessions and some storytelling uh, some of us who um, and, and I'll call it myself out as a white male sitting there listening to the stories and understanding the um, the perspective of others who aren't as privileged uh, it, it it is heartbreaking it is uh, um, embarrassing uh, it is and it, it was a call to action uh, for me uh, in my role. And I think I don't want to wait until next year's budget to say, now we can do something as far as bringing somebody in who can lead our education, lead our engagement, and lead our action on, on equity, diversity, and inclusion. This isn't a short-term thing, no. um, but it's very important. And so I'm asking for your support to seek funding and if funding is found and um, I have some ideas where I'm looking um, then you know we'll have to talk about reallocating some money within our operating budget but uh, to to match up very likely uh -huh. so but I want to get going uh, I think it's 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 way past due uh, and um, so again I'm just looking for your support to uh, to take some steps to try to begin to address this Thank you for um, just the upfront, honest, open explanation of that. I, I fully support it. Fully support it. Um, okay. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Bell. Do you need a motion? I do. I would like to make a motion that uh, Council direct the CAO to investigate establishing that position, the diversity and inclusion position. Okay, good. Second by Deputy Mayor. Any more discussion? All those in favor, oh, sorry, go ahead, Councillor. Um, I just, uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, uh, I just want to 
uh, to, just to frame it in terms of, um, you know, we none of us intend to be uh, discriminatory or unwelcoming, but systems, the institutions uh, that have been built in that form, and we're seeing this everywhere. Absolutely. Um, unless we are intentional in our determination to uh, evaluate and reflect, and uh, then then the, the institutions continue to create the same mm -hmm. barriers. So I fully support this initiative. Thank you. Okay. Did you? Are you good? Yeah, I, yeah, sorry, I got my light still on. Okay. Um, I just want to share a story that, 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 that I heard, or I guess a question and answer that I overheard, or, you know, during, during one of our sessions. And, uh, Senator Don Oliver was one of the, one of, one of the speakers, and uh, he, was, he was very compelling, as, as if you've ever heard him uh, or spent time with him, I'm sure you'd find the same. But uh, one of the questions was from one of my colleagues, the CAO, and, and and what she questioned was, is, well, you know, we are open to, you know, we recognize that we need more diversity in our organization, and we put out job ads, but we don't get the applications. We can't hire people if they don't apply. And, and what he said to that was, 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 you know, that it was one of those moments where, where things kind of hit you. He said, you know, why would they apply? Why, why would somebody from, you know, a minority community apply to a job when they've been told so many times, no, not even when you're qualified, not even when you're the best applicant, why would they put themselves through it? And so that, to me, spoke to barriers that we don't necessarily see or don't, haven't thought of, is that it isn't that we, every time, it's not us personally, it is the institutions that, are, that, are, that have said no and have caused you know, have been unfair, and we we are. If we're going to be true in our intention, we have to be intentional. We have to be engaging. We have to reach out, and we have to recognize that that one system of of uh, soliciting applications, whether it's for committees or jobs or what have you, isn't going to work. We've got to we've got to have people <coughs> who are focused on the work who can educate the rest of us, bring us changes in the way that, that we approach things, and, and create, uh, create um, connections with, with communities that, frankly, we don't have the connections with. Yep, agree. So. Agree. Okay, we good? All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Youth Advisory Group, the recommended motion there is to recommend that Council endorse the establishment of a youth advisory group to provide input and feedback to town staff on planning matters and that once established one or two of the youth representatives be appointed to planning advisory committee to advise council on planning documents and planning matters generally okay go ahead there council cleveland i think this is a really exciting thing and it was brought up to me by our new uh, planner Tony Morris who I believe actually wrote the uh, the summary that we have in front of us I would like to make that motion okay second by Councillor Hatfield did, did you want to speak to that Tony do you oh, want no, to I just gave up those questions <laughs> okay so so um, I had a question so the youth age 16 to 24 is there a reason for that? So I looked around, like, if there was, like, a standard definition of youth, and there really isn't. But the federal government, for a lot of their programs, uses that age range just because it's university age as well. Um, okay. And I just didn't want to limit it to, you know, the typical 16 to 18 kind of okay. thing. So it was to cast the net a little wider. Okay. Well. See, I guess I was sitting here thinking it needs to be cast wider because okay. even wider. But you got, I mean, I'm, I'm good with this, but, you know, like ev even up to 29 or 30, because this is, um, these, these are the folks that are, I say they're our future. They're our, they're our present, but they're our future as well. So um, 
I guess I look at the planning advisory committee and, and it's not filled with youth. That's an understatement, right? It's, it's not. And, um, and that's sad because all these decisions that are made, it's, it's their future that, that we're, um, so I guess I was hope, I, I was thinking about, um, you know, up to the age 30, however, you know, we can, we could do a matrix or something at planning for all of them, actually, for all our committees and have that matrix include, you know, and, and to Jeff's point, you know, what, what we were doing about the, the EDI piece, um, which is not a piece, it's, it, it's it's a culture. It's a it's a, it needs to be ingrained in, in who we are and what we do. But yeah, I, I I just look at some of our tables and I think the experience is there, but those fresh eyes is is missing, and and it's um, this is a good time to recognize that I guess. So uh, go ahead, Councillor Dare. So two things: um, <coughs> definition of youth, is, and I agree. Uh, one of the organizations I'm involved with. Uh, defines youth as up to 25, and another organization that I was previously involved with identified youth up to the age of 29. So there is some, some variations out there. Um, what I'd like to comment on is that uh, I, I began to look at the, when I read this through, I was a little bit more intrigued by the option two, because um, although it's nice to have youth involved in planning, um, I wonder what their opinions would be on other aspects of council business. And yeah. so, would it be nice to have like a youth shadow council that that really reflected on all of the the, the issues that come before council and if they have an opinion offer that opinion so i'm more i guess leaning towards the the advisory committee to council that would offer opinions on a wide range of topics rather than just planning thank you and it's because I, I had, it's funny, I said to Jeff, like that's, we're all, we have the discussion around is it a youth council, which, but a council makes their own decision. Um, the advisory committee advises council, which is what we're after, but how to get them, um, maybe we take care of this piece of business and then at another meeting bring, have that whole conversation, because we need to have it. The, the voices need to be heard. These are also our future councils. They are. Okay, so are there any questions for Tony? I just oh, had sorry. I, I think didn't I'm, have your light I think on. My lights on. Yes. I, I back to the age piece. I guess my thought on this was even going younger than sixteen. So going to say fourteen or fifteen. I think it's really important to capture those the youth at a younger younger age. Mm -hmm. It's I see this as an opportunity for them to make career choices going forward because they'll be on a, a committee such as planning or whatever and be able to say oh this is this is interesting like me I didn't know this existed right or or whatever committee it is and it just opens their their horizon to other things or so if you're only getting them at 16 or 18 or 20 they've kind of made those decisions typically in, in life so I just think it's an opportunity we I, I'd like to see us capture you know capture them at a younger age and and that would be such an asset for them to have on uh, a resume going forward, right? So when they're mm -hmm. applying for jobs and stuff, and to be able to say that they sat on 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 such such committee. So that would be my thing. It's not so much the you know an, uh, uh, going an older level, age. but it's to capture yeah, it's that youth, yeah. is to give them that opportunity and and uh, and that learning experience. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I agree with Councillor Hatfield, which you just said. Um, I think that you capture them young, you got them. And I also like the idea of to 29 as well. So, you know, then you got them for a long time. Um, I often have discussions in my office and with kids about just kind of what's going on. And you'd be surprised how quickly that if they didn't know, they're hooked into. And then, oh, well, hey, what happened with that? And before you know it, they're sitting at this table. So I think it's our job as, as counselors to make sure our youth, you know, to push them forward and make sure they they uh, they get here. And I, I, I thank our planner. This is, I think this is a great idea. So thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you. Councillor Lesser? Just wondering if 11A and 11B can also be mixed a bit with having to make sure the Youth, Ad youth Advisory Group um, includes members of uh, diverse communities. Like in the way we 
set up the matrix to make sure that all areas of town and all um, cultures, I guess, are represented within that group um, so that people all feel they have a, a say. I don't know when we advertise, this might be more for the CAO, uh, going back to 11A, but when we advertise um, positions, do we ever create positions that are uh, for equity hires only to start? We have. Okay. So we do that in education, and it's that's worked out quite well for us. Um, it is still hard to attract people to come to the area for the same reasons mentioned above, but by 11B, if we were to try to make sure that we have people of diversity in the youth advisory group, that might open the door down the road to some of those people actually applying for the jobs. And I think what Councillor Hatfield said about 14, um, if we if they were to be appointed for example four years, and they're 14, they some of these kids might be off to university or college before their time's up. So I think like at 16, they wouldn't be able to probably even serve like a really long term. So I think I like the idea of going to 14 as well. So I think um, I think we all agree. I mean. The, the, the EDI has to be in everything we do, and, and we're taking those steps. And we, we have to, and we started to do this. We started to do the matrixes, right? Like we started to do um, those pieces. So we just have to be intentional and aware and, and make sure that we're covering off um, in a manner that, that speaks to what we're trying to accomplish. So, what do you think of, of 14 to 29? I, I'm open to, again, like I said, there's no consistency. So okay. the 16 to 24 was kind of just. No, no, and range. it was great. It so was, if, we, if we want to do 14 to 29, you know, I'm open. Okay. To go, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, this, it's kind of arbitrary. You kind of pick a, pick a number and go. Oh, yeah. But I, I agree with uh, Councillor Hatfield that the younger you go, the, the better. And, you know, I, re I remember as a 25-year-old or a 26-year-old already having kids and a family. So I wasn't thinking that way. But if you want to make it, if you want to cast a net, let's cast it wide. So let's, let's go like 14 to 29. I mean, that's quite a, there's, there's quite a, there, that's two generations in a way. It is. You know, it's two generations that you're dealing with in two different senses and neither sense are our are, are perspectives i'm sorry and it's a more accurate word are ones that we're we're necessarily hearing so i think it's it's only good yeah okay so did we make a motion lindsay okay you did and who seconded it okay so it, if you made the motion, are you okay with, um, oh, we didn't have to put the age in there. Do we need to put the age in there? Hmm? Yeah. Let's do that. 14 to 29, let's just add it in. Yeah. Are you okay with that? Yeah, just revise okay. the motion. Whoever seconded that? We're good with that is anybody not good with it <laughs> so when Lindsay goes back and sees who okay all right any further discussion on this one okay all those in favor aye, aye. contrary motion carry thank you Tony <clears throat> okay grants discussion okay there's no attachment but the uh, we just wanted to um, just bring it here so we we understand um, where we are with regard to grants and, and we did make some uh, some changes recently I believe but but the the intention of the policy just needs to be clear we just need to make sure as a council we're clear so there's a difference between late applications which Lindsay and Lindsay just recently for one example sent out an email and said, you know, this is what our policy says. We don't accept late applications. There's a difference between that and the unforeseen circumstance or unforeseen. So, um, you know, Frank has a baseball team that 
wins, I don't know, they win provincials and they need funding from us to help get them to nationals, but they had no idea they were going to win. So something like that, do they need a couple thousand dollars and we have a contingency for it? So I think that, that was the difference. Um, and we just need to make sure at the table here we're clear because we, we always, um, I know we want to give to everything, but, but we can't, we, we simply can't. We have to follow our own rules. And um, so we just want to have that discussion at the table to see where everybody's, if everybody's good. Okay, Councillor Lesser, you're up. I think another part of the grants discussion that we all struggle with is we get, we get so much in ask and so little money to use. And it's not that we don't want to use more money, but every dollar we put in is a dollar from the taxpayer's pocket. Um, so the balance of like, do we want to increase the amount of money we're giving for grants to get more people happy? Or do we want to try to give it up to more groups and lower the amount? Um, I think like, you know, sometimes we get grant requests for, you know, three or four times what we're even, we're giving everybody. And then by the time we give them a share of it, because we're trying to spread it out, it's insulting to some of the groups that we're giving such little amounts. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's, you know, I know the grant grants have been around for a long time and um, I'm just wondering if there's, if there's any appetite to have the rules set out ahead of time so we don't have people applying for like a hundred thousand dollars when we just, we don't even have it. Um, so, you know, set a limit of how much you can apply for. Um, just cause I think it's, it's almost setting setting everybody up for failure when somebody's applying for a hundred thousand and we, we don't have a hundred thousand to give to everybody. And we know for sure we're going to be not giving much to that group in comparison to what they're asking for. So I don't know if that's something that people are interested in looking at, but I think a, a limit of what they're asking for might help, you know, guide these decisions a bit. Go ahead, Councillor Dares. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the policy has to be clear, but it also has to be consistent. Exactly. And I did like the idea of um, having a contingency set aside for the very reason that, uh, that Your Worship has stated, that there are evolving circumstances that we may not be aware of early in the year. Uh, my, my understanding was, though, that um, there was some um, notification to those that had applied this year that, that if they didn't, that they succeeded, exceeded, grossly exceeded the amount. I believe there, was feed, there may have been feedback provided to them. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case or not, but I think in the future, if that happens and we have a $100,000 ask that we just be clear and consistent and go back and tell them that, look, this is our, this is our pocket of, of um, money and this is all we can, we can do. So, you know, this application probably isn't um, suitable for an application to the town for support. I think that's being clear and consistent as well. But other than that, I, I think the policy works well. I think. I, I can't think of a better way of, of allotting the funds that we have than what we did earlier this year. Okay, anyone else? Go ahead, Deputy. I find the grants part of things one of the hardest things that we have to do because as Councillor Lester said, you, you want to give to everybody and you don't want to be disrespectful to the efforts of, <coughs> of, you know, that our community members put in. But I guess on the flip side of that, the, these are meant to be helper grants. These aren't the do all, say all, we're the main sponsor for some things that go on as well. Um, I know I took a look at our Giles policy. They do things a little bit differently and I know Modi does it as well. And um, I'm just wondering like, you know, sometimes there's caps on things or, um, you know, if you're, if you're applying for say a hall, you only get $1,500, but if it's an event, it may be $5,000 and things like that. I'm wondering if there's best practices that are, that tend to happen with municipalities that maybe that we could look into that, that strengthen our policy a little bit as well, just to, to make it easier on us when it does come down. Cause it, it would be nice to know, you know, well, regardless of what you're applying for, it's five grand max. And as Mr. As uh, Councillor Lester said, the, the ability to spread that money amongst more is kind of what you want to do, but without, you know, disrespecting those people who, who do do a good job. So I always find that hard. That's the, the one juggle that I've always had since we've been counseled. It'd be great to give all the money you can, but at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck and uh, we're always thankful for, for the efforts that people put forward. And it's not always reflective in the money that we can give, but it's, it's not an endless pot. So we, we do what we can. Go ahead, Councillor Ratfield. No, you have to just 
That's all right. I know somebody else that used to do that. <laughs> no, fur, didn't fall far from the tree, hey? Eh? I took he lessons. Leave, in, in all honesty, he would leave his microphone on the whole meeting. <laughs> and we thank, loved it. Thank you for your patience, your worship. Oh, dear. Uh, I just... My observation with regard to the grants policy is that I have a difficulty um, having language in a policy that's not adopted, you know, that we don't follow. So it, it, it just feels to me that we are, if, we're, if we're not going to follow a policy, then it should be removed and we should ask ourselves, well, maybe it shouldn't be there. And I'm talking now about a requirement for financial information from those who are seeking grants uh, and before the town. And our policy is that, and it's very clear in the application, that in order for it to be considered, we require a budget and we require a financial statement. And time and time again this year, while we were going, I was finding myself asking, well, where's the budget? Um, just saying that you've got a budget of $40,000 or $30,000 or what, that is not a budget. So I, I have to know where the money that I'm giving is going to go and how much money in the bank the organization has who is asking me to take taxpayer dollars and give it to them. And I'm not uncomfortable with having that policy uh, on, on the books, but not if we don't follow it because then it's not fair. You have organizations that that do their due diligence and provide us with information, and then you have organizations who say, yeah, no, just not going to give it to you. And um, so that's my problem. So if we are not comfortable with asking for financial information and budgets from uh, the organizations, then we should probably remove that from the policy. But if we do feel it's important, I think that we should require it. Thank you. Okay. So when you say, uh, I agree a thousand percent with you, by the way, there are rules in place and they, they aren't there uh, for any frivolous reasons. They're there to protect us, uh, to protect the organization so that they, they know they have to provide this. Um, when you say, if we're uncomfortable, my, my head, and forgive me for saying this, but my head goes to... Are we uncomfortable saying no to somebody because they didn't do what they required? And if that's the case, then we probably, if, if it's any, any one of us, then we shouldn't just be filling out the grants application period. If we're not comfortable saying no to an organization when they've been clearly advised, this is the information that we need. This is not for, and this is just me. This is not a frivolous pot of money that we say, oh, we've got free money. Let's just give you a few and give you a few, and we're going to give you some, and, and I feel really bad that I can't give more to you. But, I mean, I guess when I sit down and I look at it, I, I also look, um, and I, I, I guess it goes to, to the piece of, of what is council's job as a whole, and it's to make the difficult decisions, but it's also to input our values. And we've always said that it's to input our values into the equation. So, so you know, Councillor Dares may value one and make sure that they get funds and Councillor Hatfield values another and they may get a little bit more because of that. And it evens out because our values are put on the table and and that's what happens. But when we sit at a table and we are... Um, I hope nobody takes this around because it's not any, it's, it's just in general. I just see when we're afraid to say no, then we're in trouble. I, I think it's part of our job to, to have the courage to say no, it doesn't fit. No, we've asked you for the information and you haven't provided it. Um, and I understand that these organizations need funds. But we have to follow our rules because it's just, you said it, it's so unfair for the other ones that, that do it. And then we've seen in the past that we've said you need to provide us with funds and gone out and actually solicited the groups to, you need to pass this in or we can't give you, and, and it's a fight. So either we 
either we sit down and say, here's the rules, follow them or there's no money, um, or I, I, don't, I don't know what happens. I know that that's, I'm a little bit passionate about this because I guess I, I get in trouble when I say, no, we're not giving them money because I, I sound heartless, but it's, it's again, we got to go back. To, this is taxpayers' money we're giving out. And, and I'd love some of my taxpayers to come to me and say, why would you give them money? They didn't do what they were supposed to do. That's, not, that's just not right. So I, I'm having a hard time with this. I just would follow the rules and just say no with a, easily. Go ahead, Councillor Lesser. I think I agree with everything that's being said in, in terms of following the rules. And I, I know I, didn't, I haven't voted. My votes would not necessarily agree with what I'm that that's how I value what I value but you know I see sometimes applications come in I see the value of the application but then I think well they've got they've been able to get the money before and we haven't really been tight on it so it, to me I think it's more about re, redoing the grants application process and getting it out you know if we can do it by the fall getting it out to every organization that's ever applied um, getting it out as much as we can on social media or newspaper or whatever and say these are the rules and you know this is the maximum you can apply for this is how much money we have in in total to spend um so we're not getting and if you don't pass it in by the timeline like if we're i think if all of us are consistent saying we're not we're not going to break the rules prior to the grants even coming up um i think it's much easier but i think where we're finding our, the challenge is that we all we know it's been done before i guess and until we actually say this is like we are going to follow if it's if it's a rule and it's a policy we should be following it but knowing that it's happened in the past then it looks like we're the bad guys not doing it so yeah. i think it's just a matter of getting that policy really firm and getting out to all the stakeholders well in advance so we're not even getting so those discussions don't even have to happen they they know what's required ahead of time and um we're not getting the application even brought to council at that point so I agree. So a letter to to those folks that are applying and anyone that we think might, I mean, there might be a, a bigger reach out there um, than, than the list that we're getting that says, here's, you can look up the policy, but here's the rules. There you go. It's, it's, and, and, and in the grant application, it says th you have to do this right so it's clear um but we could still write the letter that says because i hear what you're saying we're, we're drawing a line in the sand if, if we don't get a b and c then we can't unfortunately we can't support your request but we all i mean we, we've got seven people making decisions and we have to have the guts to to stick to that i guess is what i'm saying because when it comes to the council table and and you know publicly we're taped and and everything like for some reason sometimes it's just you know i it, i i must be i just have no problem saying no but i i agree we need to get it nailed down sorry go ahead councillor dares so i'm going to go back to my original statement that we have to be clear and consistent mm -hmm. um i will say that this last year, year was difficult and we were just emerging from uh two summers of non-activity and um, there were there were groups that that weren't aware in in January that they were actually going to have an event in June mm -hmm. and so that that needs to be understood and that that, that provided some additional pressure mm -hmm. at the time that we we're making these decisions but um, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with uh, putting the onus on staff to to anticipate who might apply no, and no, get the no. information so I think you know I think what we need to do is clearly um, advertise um, yes. through social media and through the town website and Facebook page these are the rules this is the amount of money that we're dealing with and uh, you, you need to get your application in by the deadline and, and leave it at that so so before you turn your light out let me ask you this question so so the organization that doesn't know they're going to have they don't know if they're going to have an event so Jeff I think we just I don't know if we discussed it or I, I might have asked you the question today. Can they apply and then say, we don't need the funds? You know what I mean? 
Because well, I, I don't see any problem with that. I, I think we have to recognize, though, as you mentioned earlier, that there's, there's organizations out there that, that aren't aware of the fact that they are going to have an event yeah. until after the, the application deadline. So, yeah. you know, that's yeah. why I think we reserved a, a bit of money yeah. uh, for those evolving circumstances. We, we did. Yes. The, and, and we called them unforeseen exactly. yeah. versus, um, versus like late or something like that. But I guess what I'm saying is, um, so one we received recently that we have to make a decision on. Uh, they just had paperwork and they were waiting to hear back. But that's that's still a late application because can we help them understand that they can apply, but if the event that they're working on doesn't happen, then they return the funds. Does that sound fair? Jerry, is that fair or, or sensible or? It, soon as they're approved yeah exactly if we so, know an event's being held in December we you know we can come yeah, check it exactly kind of thing so CFest for example I mean we know CFest happens so it's a good example to use because it's an easy one but what if CFest is struggling they're going I don't know if we can get like a team together to to do what we want to do so we might have to cancel CFest which is it, it won't happen so it's a good example it's an easy example so they don't apply what I'm saying is they should apply and then if it doesn't happen, right, there's only a couple like that, right, if, in case something happens. They can, but, but they still need to apply, otherwise they're late. Am I, am I wrong? Go ahead there, Councillor Lesser. This won't be popular, but... Um, Neither I'm am thinking, I. <laughs> I'm thinking of, like, when you apply for grants, like if you're a teacher, you can apply for a PD, PD grant. Um, it used to be you apply once a year, and then people didn't do a lot of stuff at the beat, like right after the grants were given out because they had to wait a year to do it. Um, and not that I would ever want to go through this process two times in a year, but I'm wondering if there's some way that we can, instead of just taking late applications, if we could somehow have like two separate deadlines and a pot of money for one and a pot of, so I guess what I am saying is to do it twice a year, which which frightens me, but I, if, if organizations up to this point have applied and not follow the rules and consistently have gotten money back or money from grants, I, I still think like the wording has to somehow on like when we get the word out it has to be like we're sticking to everything this year. Like the rules are the rules, and I, I know it's if it's written you think you are sticking to the rules, but it seems like the last two years and maybe it's just because of COVID, but um, I'm taking from the conversation that it probably existed some before COVID as well. But I think we need, I think we need to have a, a review of the policy and try to figure out the best way of evenly giving out that money and not setting people up for disappointment before they even apply. Um, I guess I'm just rambling now, so I'm gonna shut my mic off. No, you're, you're actually making, you're making, you're making sense. I, I think the policy, I, I think, it's just me, the policy is good. What's not good is that we keep breaking the rules. So two things need to happen. We need to get word out clearly that here are the rules, and you get the rules with each, each grant application. Here's your deadlines. Here's the rules. Oh, no, we're not breaking any of the rules. And secondly, at this table, we have to agree that we're not breaking the rules, right? It's not going to be, well, you know, but, right? I mean, there might be some buts. <laughs> There's always a but. Anyway, sorry. Uh, Deputy Mayor. I agree with Councillor Lesser. Um, I, I know there is another, uh, uh, I don't know if it's Argyle or Modi, but I think they do two rounds as well. And, Councillor Cleveland point. and I were just having a chat and we definitely agree that the one route is hard enough but if it's really about what works best and uh, I'm, I'm also wondering with um, what Councillor Lesser said if it wouldn't be best to maybe review the policy to see what best practices are in in other municipalities and if there are a few things that could could help things be more fair or help us in the decision it might be the right way to go okay Councillor Cleveland thank you your worship a um, couple of things yeah, I agree. Two, 
But <laughs> here's the thing. I've always said, since I've been here, um, that when there's a process, there's a couple of thoughts here, but, but the first one is, when it comes to this process, there's, there's a limited amount of funds. And often, through this grant process, you're comparing apples and oranges. For example, and, and we talk a lot about how we all bring our personal values or biases, for that matter, into things. Well, as everybody knows, I'm really into events. But often, in this process, you're comparing or trying to divide that money between an event and maybe a, a van or an event and, and an organization who needs a roof or whatever that might be. And in all honesty, I'd love to see, and I know we have limited funds anyway, but I'd love to see a division where you have a fund that, okay, this money, we're going to designate this much to help out some events. This much is for other things. So that's just one thing. And, and you can agree or disagree with that. That's fine. The other part is about the rule breaking thing. And yeah, we've, we've made a lot of exceptions because COVID has left everybody just unsure. But the thing that bothers me a little bit is, again, you go back to the fact that we have, we have a limited amount of money here. And say somebody, somebody submits, and they've always submitted, and they didn't follow the rules. They didn't do the, the proper budgeting. They, they prob you know, it wasn't done right. But we gave them money because we felt that they deserved the money or should have the money or it was an important event. The next person followed all the rules and maybe it was something less sexy and they didn't get it. What kind of a message are we sending? Mm -hmm. You know, the person who followed the rules is, is the one perhaps that we ignored. And so consistency, it is. It has to be one way or no way. And so really we have reached that point. Now, now I, I'm the biggest criminal when it comes to um, ignoring deadlines and stuff when I, when I felt something was necessary. But, and, and it's because of the, the COVID, you know, the way COVID has been. But we have to reach a point where we have to draw that line and say, okay, if you're not going to submit it the way we're asking for it, we're not going to consider it because this person did. They did what they were asked. So they deserve more consideration for that, for following that, as opposed to someone who didn't follow those rules. Just my money's worth. No, I, I agree. The other, the other thing is um, there's applications that don't need money. It, they, they, they simply don't need the money and, and we're in the habit of saying and, and that's again that's a, that's a values thing you know if somebody thinks it's important to put the money on the table but we have had applicants here when, where we've said do you need the funds no but I just applied because it's, it's there like why, why do we do that why do we feel the need to write that number down so it, it goes to again I keep saying the values it's, and, it, and it's that whole thing, what you're saying about events, events are important. I don't think it's because you like events that you're putting the money down there. You know the value that events bring to this community. And without it, we're in a mess, right? So, so when I say values, I'm not just saying personal, my personal feelings. I'm saying we know at this table because we talk to people and we're in the community why something is important so we put our numbers down right so you're you're bang on there but when we write you know numbers so we when I write a big number down because I don't want to hurt someone's feelings I'm not doing my job I'll just leave it at that it's hard but it's anyway go ahead last I, I, yeah, I promise right. um, I, I don't disagree with uh, Councilor Lesser's um, way of thinking and I, I don't think policy review is ever a waste of time never so maybe we should really look at that and review that policy. I also wonder if in consideration of that, that you know, if somebody does submit uh, in advance of the deadline, they submit an application that's not complete, should they receive um, just a rejection notice saying you're, not you're being rejected, your application is not complete, and this is why? Now, I don't know if that's, but perhaps that should be considered during the review. But I think a policy review is, as I say, never a waste of time. So I'd make that motion. Yeah. OK. For, you're making the motion for the policy review. Second by the deputy mayor. 
Okay, go ahead, Z.A. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that occurs to me is, you know, we staff don't want to be getting into making judgment calls about the completeness of an application mm -hmm. uh, so much. Um, but one of the things that I've experienced fairly recently online is that trying to fill out an online form or a survey or whatnot, if I don't complete certain fields, I can't submit the darn thing. And, and so what I'm, what I'm thinking is, is if we could have a grants portal, and I don't know if that, you know, when we come to accessibility, that might not be, you know, the, the, uh, the best approach, but it's an approach to say, you know what, here's a convenient way, your convenience in your jammies, at your computer, you can fill out the grant application form and not accept it if, if certain fields are not, are not completed. So that's one way that we can vet. And, and, and we wouldn't have to necessarily, you know, screen them as staff. Ones that come in traditional method of filling out the paper, then, then there would be a, a process there. But um, I, I think if we can encourage people to do the online submission and have the portal set up to encourage a complete application, then at least that part is done. It is. Or we can decide this at another meeting because we'll just, yeah. <laughs> we can't be here all night. But or just get the word out that says, you know what, we're only accepting online applications. And then it, you're right. When they can't fill that in, it's like me applying for anything online. If I don't fill in my phone number, I'm not, it's not going to let me go any further. So then we get all the information. People's feelings aren't hurt, except for the people that don't like to fill things out online, but welcome to 2022, right? So there's help with that. There, There is help with that. Jeff's disagreeing. We are. Okay, go ahead, Deputy. I, I like that idea of the, the online. The only thing is I, I, I think of the seniors clubs and whatnot that apply. So I think if we do go that route, it would be good to offer support for those people. Maybe they could do their application in paper and come in with someone and staff to, to aid them to make sure that it's just not because the computer age doesn't work for everybody nowadays. Yeah. And a lot of our seniors sometimes would get left out on that. Thanks for that, because I was just thinking of the people that don't like to do it online. Go ahead, Councillor Bell. Yeah, I, I'm very sympathetic to people who don't want to do things online. Uh, I know some people like that. Um, but I did want to just um, make an observation that the library is in town, and I believe that it still offers assistance to individuals who require <coughs> it to manage basic computer skills so it's a really wonderful resource a little plug there to the <laughs> to the gates lab at the uh, Yarmouth at the Yarmouth library um, so so there is help for people if if they do need help with computer literacy um, just just an observation yep thank you okay so there's a motion on the floor are we ready for the vote Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. <laughs> As we always say, it's the little ones that bring out the big discussions. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. Okay, so Jeff, what do we want to do from here? Do we, I mean, we have staff here that, yep. that wants to do the water because we can yep. go in camera later. Yes, so a uh, couple things I want us, we'll do in camera at the end, if that was your question. Yes, that's. Uh, before we adjourn this meeting, there are a couple things I want to update council on, and, and I don't think either of them is a surprise at this point. <clears throat> uh, one is that our, our grants coordinator, our funding coordinator, has taken a position with NSFM. Uh, he, uh, I think he was highly sought after by them, to be honest. Uh, he was recruited. Uh, and uh, he's moving to Halifax for a position that I think he's going to be very happy with and, and obviously very successful with. So we're wishing him the best. Um, that's Brandon Durkee. Um, Brandon was with us for just over a year, and uh, he made, I think, somewhere in the area of 20 different applications to funds <coughs> that, uh, you know, in looking at it now, I would say that without his assistance and his role, we might have applied to five. Um, some of those applications were done in coordination with some of our intermunicipal corporations, a couple of them with Mariner Center and Mariners on Main, and, and so uh, a high degree of success. And 
when I say a high degree of success, I'm talking, we're looking at 50% uh, success applicant, and there are still some pending applications that we don't know about, know about yet. There are a couple that we uh, don't know about yet, but that we've been told, you know, our chances are really, really, really good. So highly successful. I think uh, part of the success came from his interpersonal skills, uh, his ability to integrate with our staff and to work with uh, our engineers and our uh, Natalie and, and her staff and, and operational services and, and Jerry and, and his staff and, and to become part of the organization, understand the business that we're into, make applications make sense, make relationships with the grant providers and, and ultimately success. And, and I can tell you at the AMA conference uh, last week, uh, some of the folks I talked to from the province, they recognized Brandon and they, and they recognized what, what skill he had in what he did. So, so we'll miss him, but I know he'll be successful in what he does next. And we'll look to replace him with somebody uh, with, with the same qualities that can carry on uh, with, those, with those files and, and the success he had. The other <coughs> person I want to update you on is, is, of course, no surprise, our, our former town engineer. Uh, I say former because tomorrow he is retiring. Uh, retiring not for the first time. He retired uh, in 2019 to come and work for us. Um, back in July 2019, we were in a bit of a pickle. We had uh, recently uh, had a vacancy in our, in our engineering department. We had large projects uh, such as the ferry terminal uh, revitalization that needed to be completed and, and there was a, on that one in particular, there was, a, there was an imperative to meet a deadline and that was to be ready when the ferry was ready to operate. And it was a big project, it was not traditional uh, municipal infrastructure and we needed some assistance. And I reached out to a guy who had been hanging around some of our um, some, our, some of our public consultations on the art center and, and uh, had showed up at the ferry terminal for a, for a, uh, a contractor's tour and, and was talking to me on the side and I thought, this guy knows what he's talking about. And so when I found myself in that pickle, I reached out to, to Mark Profi and uh, he, he not only gave up his vacation that August, part of his vacation to come and work for the town. And we called it kind of a month long interview to see if if he liked the work, he liked us, and if, if we liked him. And uh, so he gave up his vacation, and, and, and in the end, he gave up his retirement. He retired early from the federal government to, to come and work for the town of Yarmouth and to, to shepherd through um, you know, countless projects. He, he went through so much money. Uh, he, gave, he gave Jerry, uh, Ger Jerry uh, heart palpitations, I'm sure. Uh, but he did a fantastic job. And uh, not only that, um, Mark, is, is a coach. He's, he's a, a natural coach, but he's an experienced coach in the sporting world. And, you know, the young people, and I call them young because they're all younger than me, the young people that worked under his wing in the engineering department gained uh, a heck of an experience, uh, you know, learning from his work habits and his insights and his experience. And, and I learned as well. Uh, Mark is, is a fantastic interpersonal uh, person and, and a, a tremendous communicator. And, uh, you know, I, I watched him and, and at times when we went through COVID, uh, you know, there were times when I had, uh, I was uncertain. I mean, we all had uncertainties, but mm -hmm. I was uncertain about what to do and, and uh, whether I was doing the right thing at times. And Mark was always there to, to, uh, to give me his two cents worth um, or his million dollars worth. Uh, you know, he, he was there to, to, uh, to support me and to support the organization. So. Um, we are we are saddened um, to to lose Mark uh, in our engineering department, but he's left us in a good place with uh, with I think Demario both feet on the ground and and ready to go. Uh, I'm thrilled for Mark that he's he's going to have at least a couple weeks of vacation uh, <laughs> and retirement, and and we'll see what's next for Mark. Uh, Mark uh, uh, has deserve deserves every bit of praise that that he he receives and 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 he. As, as we saw yesterday at the ferry event, uh, there, were, there were many, many kind words from Mark. Um, yet last week at the AMA meeting, engineers with the province of Nova Scotia were coming up to me and they're saying, how did, I don't know how you did it. I don't know where you found Mark. I don't know how you find these people. Uh, but they, they, were, they were blown away by what they, what they experienced in dealing with Mark, DeMario, 
Brandon, uh, when they came down, Luke as well on that team, you know, showing them projects and, and, and executing work that was, that was beyond anything else that they expect, uh, anything else they experience, sorry. So again, I just wanted to point out, Mark is retiring. I want to publicly thank him and, um, and uh, you know, wish him well in his retirement. I think we all echo that, Mark. And, and for the record, we are, we're, we are sad to lose you, but, but we're thrilled that you get to carry on and have some vacation before the, the wife cut, had cut us off. <laughs> okay, um, anything else, Jeff? No. You good? So are we going to do the water meeting now and then... Yes, that that works. You good with that, Steve? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, we need a minute just uh, to, I guess, be prepared for the, a presentation. Uh, um, Tony has a, a visual four slides that he wants sure. to use. So yeah. just take a, maybe a bio break, and and uh, we'll resume in a few minutes.